Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased today to have with me both of the authors of a new book from Oxford University Press titled Key Changes, The Ten Times Technology Transformed the Music Industry, which does exactly what it says, takes us through the history of the music business and how technology, technological advances have disrupted it, shaped it, reshaped it over the last century. So I'm very pleased to welcome both authors, Howie Singer and Bill Rosenblatt, to the podcast. Thank you both for being here. Thanks very much for having us. Ditto. (laughs) Could we start off, please, with a bit of an introduction of each of you and explain why this book, why write it together? Sure. This is Howie. And... um... I worked for Warner Music for uh, 15 years, one of the largest music companies, and um, uh, had joined them after getting started with startups as the digital transition happened. So I was at a ringside seat, both from the startup world and the major label world on the transitions that occurred from CD to Napster to downloads to streaming and beyond today, um, and always thought when I left Warner, which happened five or six years ago, that it would be interesting to write a book about what I had lived through. But many of those books got written because Napster was such a colossal change in the industry. So there are a number of books about those most recent eras. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this was not a new story. This was not something that had occurred to the industry just in the late 90s. It was something that went right back to the beginning of the industry and the founding of the phonograph and the music business and decided that what was really needed, because I couldn't find anything like this, was a book that covered the history of technology in the industry right from the start and um, was busy doing other things, consulting and teaching at NYU. Bill and I both teach data analytics at NYU. And then when March 2020 rolled around and we locked down for COVID, I started writing that book. And I wrote a couple of chapters and sent it to people who were knowledgeable and whose opinions I valued. And one of those people was Bill. Sure. And so I, um, <clears throat> I have a, a background that's in some ways similar to Howie's, in some ways a little different. We're both educated in computer science, at least partially. Um, I also have some training in business and finance uh, after I graduated from college, or, and actually after grad school. I'm also a musician of sorts. I'm the son of two musicians. My father was a classical musician in the Philadelphia Orchestra. My mother was a pianist. And um, I did radio in college and thereafter, always for nonprofit uh, radio stations. And I've done various things professionally related to the music industry. I got to know Howie uh, just before he started his job at Warner in the early 2000s, and I've been a consultant since the year 2000, having been um, in positions relating to IT and the media industry before then for for a few years. And I'm I'm also an author of a couple of technical books. I've been an editor of, of a technical book. I've been a magazine columnist in the IT industry. And so when Howie first came to me with this idea, you know, I had, a, I had three thoughts. One was his I, original idea was to, re, uh, to write a textbook for a class. And having worked in higher education publishing, I said to him, well, nobody really writes textbooks anymore. That's kind of a dead field. Number two was I felt that this would make a great trade book title, meaning, of course, a, a book that you buy in a bookstore such as Waterstones or, or Barnes & Noble. And then number three, my thought was, would you like any help? And he said yes, uh, because I really liked his idea. And it being the summer of the uh, lockdown, the pandemic lockdown, I, like many other people, was thinking about writing another book. And his idea, I thought, was a lot more compelling than the ideas that I was thinking about. Makes sense then to join efforts. Thank you for giving us that background to the book. 
getting into then its kind of overarching premise of focusing on format changes and revenues over time, can you help us understand why this lens is such a good way to understand the evolution of the music industry? Bill, perhaps you want to start off? Um, I think Howie should start that one, actually. Okay. Um, I thought you might talk about the phases of revenues oh, and then sure. talk well, about I, the I six Cs. Yes, I can do that. So, sure. So, Howie had this concept of the six Cs, which he will explain shortly. But the other thing that had happened was I write for Forbes about the music industry and the media industry more broadly. And I wrote an article several years ago that talked about different eras of the music industry um, to provide context for what we now might call the download era of you know the mid to late 2000s when iTunes was up and people were buying downloads for 99 cents each. And the, the idea for the article was basically that the download era was a bl little blip in the entire history of the music industry. And I reproduced a chart in that article, a line chart that shows the industry revenue totals, annual industry revenue totals, U.S. industry revenue that the RIAA, which is the U.S. Trade Association for the Music Industry, gives out. And it really shows how different formats define different eras of peak revenue for the music industry, recorded music industry. And so the idea that the music industry is defined by eras that are driven by formats for distributing music to the public is something that I felt was important and I felt uh, resonated. And so when Howie came to me with his idea, it sort of fit very neatly into what I had all, always also been thinking about with regard to that article. And that leads us to Howie's framework and the six C's. Right. And, you know, that picture that is in, reproduced in our book as well that shows these phases of the business, what, what tends to happen, and it, that chart only goes back, you know, 50 or so years, not to the beginning of the industry, is that when, you know, there is a mass market format, and the industry's had many failed formats, and we mentioned those in the book, but when the format takes over, whether it's tape cassette or vinyl or downloads or today's streaming and, and uh, TikTok, the chart shows that in terms of the business making revenues from those things. But thinking about what happens once that technology gets into place, and really it's a series of technologies, it's never just one. The download era didn't happen um, simply because of an MP3 file, which was certainly the dominant format. But to have that business take off required networks to be in place that were fast. In particular, uh, it happened first at university campuses, which is why that was where Napster first took off as the first, you know, download offering that got to a mass market, although not one that was paid for, certainly. Um, you had to have computers that could rip CDs so that people could make their own MP3s that could burn files to CDs so they could take their music with them. It's always a group of technologies that sort of coalesce to create that new format. And so we labeled that uh, cutting edge technology. And that's true for the radio. It's true for um, vinyl records, et cetera. And once that technology is in place, the rest of the business morphs, how they make money changes that's the cash, the second of the six C's. And that's reflected in that revenue chart that Bill discussed. The artists change what they do to maximize their connection with fans and to maximize, in many cases, the money that they can make. Fans doesn't start with C, so we use creators instead. The recipients of the content, the fans change what they listen to. They change their engagement with artists and how they do that. And that's consumers, not the best word, but it does start with C. Um, how that music gets to the fans changes. That's the channel, the, di the distribution channel, whether that was physical record stores and retailers in the old days or it's streaming services today. Um, and the last of the C's is copyright because often... 
Uh, the new technology gets out ahead of what the laws allow you to do. We're seeing that today with artificial intelligence. We're just at the beginning of the fights over copyright and AI and training materials. And often that takes the longest time for the industry to adjust. So the, the technology always comes first. That's how we start every chapter. We explain how CDs work and how streaming works and what technologies were required to make it a reality. But then the other parts, the other disruptions that morph the industry come after. And we tell that story in whatever way makes the most sense to get that across to the reader. But every chapter in the book is organized around these six C's which makes it quite interesting and easy to compare across changes over time. Um, so I very much appreciate it as the reader having such a clear framework to follow. Now that we have that introduction of kind of what we're doing, how we're doing it, uh, I think I'm probably going to try and stick roughly chronologically in my next series of questions. Um, and I'd like to start with a sort of early bit of music history that I personally was not as aware of, um, perhaps the, the prevalence of the CD in my childhood um, made me kind of assume that discs have always been a part of music history. But in fact, um, early on in the book, you both detail that discs were not necessarily the inevitable way forward, that cylinders, in fact, could have been the form factor, at least in the beginning, and who knows how that might have continued. So can you introduce us to why discs prevailed over cylinders, and maybe what this tells us about how two of the C's, sort of technological change versus consumer demand, sort of go along together or maybe compete a little bit. Uh, I don't know, Howie, if you want to start with this one? Sure. Um, well, one of the common misconceptions is that the reason that cylinders lost out to discs was because this sounded better. But in fact, that wasn't the case. Cylinders actually did uh, sound better at the time. They were part of Edison's original invention, and the other companies that came along started out with cylinders as well. And, you know, it is worth noting one thing that carries forward. And we do talk about these themes across time after we get through all the formats. We wrap up the book this way. This message that convenience wins out over audio quality is a consistent one. And it's not just uh, uh, the convenience of uh, 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 the use of the product, it's even the convenience to the makers of the product as well. And um, if you think about how a cylinder is stored, you know, it looks like a can of peas or other vegetables. And in fact, that's one of the things that gave rise to complaints about recorded music being canned music. It's because the product was contained in a, in a holder that looked like a, a, a can. Um, and, but the, the discs were far easier for consumers to deal with. They were easier to change and mount on the product. They were easier to store. If you just think about your rack of vinyl records, you store them vertically, they line up, you can read the information on the spine of the product. Discs were harder to stack up. If you, if you, even if you had many of them, you could stack them. But how did you then know which one was which? And they put the information on the end of the cardboard case, but it was much less user-friendly than those discs were. And in addition, manufacturing uh, the discs and using the stamping and molding method that, by the way, is still used today. You know, the way that uh, products were designed um, and manufactured in quantity, it became much easier to make many, many discs than to make uh, copies of cylinders. And that was yet another advantage to the manufacturers. So, you know, the the even the fact that the disc needed to have a paper label in the middle to prevent the needle from popping out of the groove because as the the turntable turns at a constant speed the amount of time it takes to make sort of a full revolution gets less and less and as you get to the middle of the record and the needle's going faster and faster relative to the getting around the disc 
it would pop out. And so they put a paper label there. And that was a really convenient thing for the consumer. It could say the name of the company, then, and it's why we call them record labels. It could say the name of the artist, the name of the song. So there were a myriad of reasons that made the cylinder went out. And by the way, Edison was the last one to change because he thought technically that the cylinder was superior and it was from an audio quality perspective, but it wasn't from the consumer's perspective. And as is typically the case, ultimately the consumer wins out. That is definitely not what I expected. Um, So fascinating history. Bill, is there anything you'd like to add on this point? Well, I, I would just say that the convenience trumps quality, as Howie implied, the convenience trumps quality uh, theme is is constant <laughs> throughout the history of, of the music industry. And even when vinyl formats came out, the 45 versus the 33, there was a format war. Uh, the Columbia Records came out, uh, Peter Goldmark, a German who, a German Jew who escaped the Nazis. Um, actually, I don't think he was German, maybe Hungarian, but he was a Jew who escaped the Nazis. He came to the U.S., worked for Columbia Records, and led the team that designed what we now know as the 12-inch LP. And <clears throat> over at RCA Records, they had their own format, which was a 7-inch single, what we now know as the 7-inch single with a larger hole in the middle. And in fact, the 45 was designed to have better sound quality than the 33, uh, simply by virtue of its faster speed, because the faster the speed is, the more physical vinyl or tape or whatever substance you're using um, can be used to encode audio. And so 33 RPM was a way of fitting a certain amount of audio material in on a single disc the disc being the same size as 78 RPM discs, meaning um, 12 inch uh, uh, diameter. But actually there was a better quality aspect to the 45. The con- of course, there was also a convenience aspect to the 45, which was that it was smaller, easier to carry around and so on. But um, that that aspect of it at first ended up sort of losing out. Then it came to the fore when rock and roll came out and it became um, a natural fit for this smaller physical format. But we have the convenience versus quality issue play out with uh, the two vinyl formats, and we have it play out with cassettes versus reel-to-reel and eight tracks. We have it play out with various um, digital codecs in the download era. This just happens over and over and over again. Hmm. And I think is therefore kind of worth highlighting how early it starts and, as you've just said, how frequently it continues. So on that sort of idea of continuity, how you've already given us some examples um, of things that w- they start all the way back there, right? Foundational elements like it being called a record label because it literally is a label. What are some of the other foundational elements of the music industry that were established, I think, especially in the era of the phonograph? There seemed to be quite a lot in that period. Um, again, Howie, maybe you want to start us off with this? Sure. Um, so what's interesting is that, you know, um, if, if we ask people, you know, to talk about the foundational elements of the industry, they'll think of Edison. We have a, you know, the person who we have a photograph of in the chapter uh, and photographs is Thomas Edison and certainly a great inventor, but he was not the greatest businessman when it came to the foundational elements. And it was Emil Berliner who, invented the gramophone who put many of the pieces in place. He focused on discs rather than cylinders, which we've already talked about. He focused on playback only. The first phonographs had recording capability in part because Edison thought a big part of the business would be dictation machines. Obviously, if you're not recording and only doing playback, you can make cheaper machines, less less features, less complexity. Um, And Berliner... Uh, actually had a speech in 1888, uh, 135 years ago, where he said that discs would be standardized and playable on any machine, that there'd be a standard manufacturing process that could create millions of copies from a single disc. Um, He predicted that performers would make money from royalties 
um, for recordings that got sold. And he helped to put that system in place with the you know, biggest recording star of his day, Enrico Caruso, uh, who made um, a fortune from recordings and royalties, although his son said he made a fortune, but the record labels made an even bigger fortune, which yet again is something that we see today as, as you know, artists often complain about what they could make from um, streaming. So many of these elements were there. And, you know, perhaps one most significant one is that Caruso became the face of the product. He was in the advertisements. Um, Edison didn't feel that artists should make a lot of money, another example of perhaps not the best business decision. And he recorded choruses and church choirs in New Jersey, where his lab was located, because he didn't have to pay a lot of money for it. On the other hand, uh, Berliner's company was willing to pay Enrico Caruso quite a bit of money. It was so much money that when the person recording him in Italy asked permission to spend the you know, thousands of dollars to make the first 10 recordings with Caruso, the telegram came from New York saying that's exorbitant, don't pay it. He proceeded anyway. And to some degree, Enrico Caruso became, in a name that people can identify with today, the Taylor Swift of his day in terms of his level of popularity around the world. That is a pretty big deal um, and a very apt reference. Bill, is there anything you'd like to add on this one? Uh, no, uh, that's fine. <laughs> Fair enough. No, that was a very good answer. Um, I'd love to move forward in history from the phonograph era to transistor radios and especially the role that they play, as described in the book, in helping rock and roll become such a big deal. Um, Bill, can you explain this link for us? Sure. So the w- one f- sort of funny thing to start with is, and this was part of the elevator pitch that we had to publishers when our agent uh, and, and we were selling the book, which is there have been a bunch of books recently that about the history of the music industry that focus on what happened during the Napster era. And the theses of all these books are all basically the music industry was humming along fine until Napster came along and blew it up. Well, actually, there were several times that the industry got blown up over the past over a century. And our book discusses and and Napster being one of them, of course, and our book discusses them. And one of the times that the industry took a really big hit was right after World War II, which was probably the biggest economic boom in U.S. uh, 20th century history, right after the Second World War. And yet during this huge economic boom, the music industry's revenues were cut by about a quarter in a very short period of time because of this format war between um, the 7-inch 45 and the 33-inch LP from RCA and Columbia, respectively. And so now you get to the mid-1950s, and there's a confluence of events that caused the record industry to revitalize. And there was a, and and Howie likes to mention this point, but I'll mention it here, that it's not just, and I think he mentioned it previously with regard to um, digital formats, it's not just one technology that comes out and changes everything. It's a confluence of technological factors that have to come together to create a way to distribute, a new way to distribute music to the public. And so in this case, there was a confluence of things that happened uh, in the mid fifties around a combination of the seven inch 45 radio and the uh, radio as in stations and what they broadcast and this pocketable transistor radio. And that uh, happened around rock and roll and top 40 radio formats. So you had rock and roll, you had Elvis, you had Chuck Berry and and so on. And you had a growing interest among the electronics industry to create these very portable radio devices instead of the big clunky consoles that sat in the living room. And uh, the transistor greatly accelerated that process. There were attempts to make pocketable vacuum tube or valve, as you would say, on on your side of the pond, uh, radios, but they didn't work very well, that had very bad sound quality, short battery life, and so on. The transistor just was a much 
better enabling technology for pocketable radios. And so you had teenagers, people who uh, were, were baby boom, baby boom uh, kids who all of a sudden got some disposable income through their, you know, paper routes or whatever they had when they were teenagers. They could get a transistor radio for not that much money once the Japanese came in and the prices came down. They could go buy their 45 singles of Elvis and, you know, Pat Boone and Chuck Berry and Ray Charles and whoever else it was. And you had this whole big industry around that, which was further enabled and accelerated by Top 40 Radio, which which um, injected this sort of virtuous cycle where the biggest hits got played the most often, which engendered more sales of those records at the record store, which would then turn around and report their top selling records to the radio stations, which would then play those records and the, and the cycle continued. And so that whole um, combination of factors came together to create this sort of second piece of the record industry alongside <clears throat> the industry that was forming around the 12 inch LP, which was classical Broadway, the new jazz that was coming out instead of three minute selections by Lester Young and Duke Ellington um, and you know people at Louis Armstrong onto 78s you had um, what, the bebop of the era where people like Miles Davis and you know Dizzy Gillespie were playing long improvisations in clubs finally they had a record format that enabled them to put those longer uh, improvisations down. And so you had jazz as part of that as well. So you really had this bifurcated industry that um, happened in the mid fifties and the transistor radio was certainly a big part of that. Staying on the topic of radio, because it is such um, an influential part of this. Can you maybe walk us through, Bill, some of the quirks in US copyright law that enabled radio to be such a big deal? Sure. So it, it's another common theme in our book that some of these formats and their ascendancy in the industry uh, was uh, were enabled by quirks or loopholes in copyright law that um, various interests in the business could exploit, identify and exploit. And so the part of the of copyright law that we're talking about here is this question that came up about whether sound recordings should get copyright protection. So musical compositions, and you can think of that as like the sheet music, those were always protected by copyright because they were writings, just like a piece of text is a writing and just like a painting or a drawing is a writing. You know, a piece of sheet music is something that you can give to a musician who knows how to interpret it and then they can play it on their instrument, whatever that may be, or sing it. But the idea of a sound recording going all the way back to piano rolls, is that, avail is that eligible for copyright protection or not? Well, that question was up in the air and was not answered, uh, at least in the United States, until the mid 1970s, sorry, early 1970s. And so there was a very long time when um, sound recordings didn't have copyright protection and then starting in 1972, they had partial copyright protection. And the part that they did not have was what we call uh, performance rights and sound recordings, which basically in this context means if you play a record on the radio, then you don't owe royalties to the record label or the recording artist. You do owe royalties to the songwriter or composer, assuming that it's in copyright, it's not public domain, but you don't owe any royalties to the label or or um the the artist that that did the performance and so that made it sort of a lot easier and cheaper for radio stations to play records they didn't need any permission on the sound recordings and the ways in which royalties on the compositions were collected were what we call a blanket license which is a bulk fee paid to a performing performing rights organization <coughs> like ASCAP or BMI or in the UK you've got PRS and you could just sort of pay them a, a lump sum or a flat fee that depended on your revenue. So the ease of licensing and the fact that you didn't have to pay for or ask permission for playing records really um, enabled radio to become a huge, huge uh, promotional 
mechanism for for music. In fact, I'd say a lot of people today are too young to have lived through the era where radio was by far the most powerful promotional mechanism for recorded music. If you wanted to get your record sold, you had to get it played on the radio. There was sort of no two ways about it. And so that led to payola, that led to all kinds of phenomena. But the the root of it, I would say, or at least a root of it, was the fact that the radio stations didn't need to pay royalties. They didn't need permission. They could just go ahead and play whatever they wanted. Which is absolutely fascinating. Howie, is there anything you'd like to add on this point? I would. Less related to radio, but again, to try and draw some threads from the start of the industry to what we're seeing today. As Bill said, um, you know, piano rolls is where we trace the so-called mechanical license to make a copy uh, related to the composition. Um, That took years after the introduction of uh, cylinders and discs until there was coverage for those in the early 1900s. But the main argument that was being made by the people that said, well, we shouldn't have to pay to make these copies was that the piano roll and the disc were not legible to humans. They weren't readable items. They couldn't be interpreted by a human being. They were part of a machine, a player piano or a phonograph. And that was the way you could interpret the information that was contained in the holes on the roll or the grooves on the record. Um, and that was the argument that was there today. In that was the world, one of the arguments. There, that was one of the various, arguments. Yeah, yeah. One of them. Yeah. Yeah. And today in the world of AI, we have companies in AI saying, well, there is no readable thing within these AI models that constitutes the song or the music. We're seeing sort of, you know, a hundred, more than a hundred years later, the same kind of arguments that we don't know what's in this black box of a large language model that's looking at the lyrics and you can't necessarily find a copy of the song. So again, there are threads. It's part of the reason why it's useful to learn history, to connect the dots. Today, the same kinds of arguments are being made in court cases that revolve around artificial intelligence. Yeah, and there's another set of arguments around creativity that, that's sort of a common thread throughout the decades. And this is all quite apart from the legalistic arguments that various factions made uh, about why sound recordings should or should not get copyright protection. And so one of the arguments made in the early days was, well, sound recordings are not creative enough. All they are is somebody interpreting what's on the sheet music. And there, there have been several rounds, there were several rounds of congressional hearings about this. And we're talking a period of 50 years or so, during which time this was all argued about, you know, in, ad infinitum. And at one point, I think it was in the early 60s, there was a congressional hearing. And one of the witnesses who came to testify was a man named Nat Hentoff, who was one of the leading jazz critics of the time. And he said, No, it's absolutely not true that there's no creativity in jazz. When a musician is recording something, they it's an improvisation. They're creating just as much as the composer of whatever tune it was uh, was was creating. And so that's one reason why sound recordings should be considered worthy of copyright protection. And the same arguments are playing out just as how we said today with AI, is is AI really creating anything or is it just a machine spitting out something according to an algorithm? I think this, in fact, is um, something I found particularly helpful about having such a clear framework to follow throughout the book, because it does allow these threads, you know, if you're continually looking at copyright going, hang on, that's actually similar to what was happening back in that earlier period and helps us um, see these continuities and trends. So thank you both for um, adding those pieces into our discussion of copyright at this point. Um, However, as much as I could probably ask you so many more questions about legal aspects to this, I will move us on. Um, And I suppose I am revealing my age a little bit because I'm not really going to ask you kind of why was the CD era so um, big? Why was it such a big thing? I in some ways feel like I lived some of it. And in fact, I'm more interested in what you talk about in the book Um, of being some of the friction points of the CD era, specifically this great sentence where you say, quote, the unprecedented prosperity and fan frustration 
from the CD were like plates under the Earth's surface, rubbing against each other to form a fault line. Often we think of the CD era as being great for the music industry. This sentence suggests perhaps a bit more nuance to the story. So maybe Howie, you could start us off explaining it? Yeah. Well, first we should say it was great. Um, it was great for lots of reasons. It was the most you know, profitable era for the industry. Although if we go right back to that graph of the different formats, you can see if you account for inflation as as we do in the book, that there were peaks many times, although part of the reason the CD proved to be so successful was that people like me, and I lived through it as well, we rebought our collection of vinyl records because there were so many things better about the CD and convenient. They were more convenient than vinyl. They didn't get scratched as easily. Um, you could access track number four individually by pressing the right buttons. Um, so there were many things that made it better. They were ultimately portable with the disc man and I could listen on my headphones when I was out exercising. So there were lots of reasons that it was so successful and it was so profitable. They, the industry charged more than vinyl um, and there were even discounts at first that gave them better margins for this new format. Um, but because it was so profitable, the industry actually made business decisions to drive people to buy the CD rather than the single. We've talked about uh, you know, rock and roll and the A and B side being affordable for teenagers, but because the CD was so profitable, the industry actually, to some degree, waged war on the single. They wouldn't promote a particular song on radio, get people interested in this artist, in this music. And then when they went to their record store, there was no single to be purchased. It was only uh, obtainable by buying the album. And so obviously that was a much more profitable item. Or they would issue a single, but they would um, cap the number of units they would make. So you'd go to the record store and the slot for the single was empty because they had already all been purchased and they weren't going to get restocked. And so you bought the album. And so we could find one hit wonders. Um, you know, the song Torn by Natalie Imbruglia was not available as a single. Her album sold a lot of copies, uh, never achieved that level of success again. And who can forget Tub Thumper by Chumba Wumba that falls in the same category. So, Fans were frustrated because they had to go spend $17 instead of a few dollars for a single. Um, the bits on that CD were not protected. They were protected by the immaturity of the technology alone. There was no you know, personal computer business when the CD was launched. And the computers that were around didn't have enough storage uh, to even put the bits that were on the CD on the storage medium within the computer. There were no algorithms to compress the music, so you didn't have to store all those bits on the CD. You could store 1 in 10 or 1 in 20 bits, which is what MP3 enabled eventually. There was no way to take the music with you, but eventually there were CD burners. So it was as if uh, the elements required to disrupt the business were inherent in the CD and the, the prosperity, the, the profitability of that product led the industry to make choices that when all those pieces came together in the nineties, uh, late nineties, ultimately the last piece was a network fast enough to send the bits over so you could share it with your friends. It was as if, you know, Napster was like, uh, you know, the, the earthquake that did shake the industry but the fault lines were there already because of the decisions that had been made from the business and um, the industry perhaps did not move as quickly as they should have because that probability was so great. Mm. That, that actually makes a lot of sense. Bill, is there anything you'd like to add on this? Well, a another sort of um, element of frustration during the CD era that is, you know, maybe a little bit less important than the, than the elements that Howie mentioned and has flown under the radar uh, quite a bit for reasons that will become apparent shortly is the fact that some songwriters, a lot of songwriters did not get paid their royalties for a lot of reissues of albums on CDs. 
uh, or at least didn't get paid for a long time and only and not until after lawsuits were filed. And that's because there was such a rush to reissue material on CDs that had been out on vinyl and tape formats uh, that there was a process of re-clearing the mechanical royalties on the compositions that uh, got sort of <clears throat> put into a, a, a backlog. And there was a growing backlog of, of unpaid mechanicals on the music that was on uh, an albums that were being reissued on CDs. Um, and the backlog just grew and grew and grew. And there was a tacit agreement between the labels and the music publishers, even as those two types of companies increasingly were under the same corporate umbrella uh, to just, we're not gonna hold the, these releases up. We need to get them out there in the market because they're selling like hotcakes and we need to you know, get on this train before it, um, what, uh, pick your metaphor, uh, derails or comes to a stop or whatever it is. And so, there are a lot of songwriters who didn't get paid their royalties. The Music Publishers Association um, sued the record labels. There was a settlement that uh, amounted to tens of millions of dollars. And all of this was sort of kept very quiet because nobody wanted to air the dirty laundry from the industry. Um, but, but funnily enough, I was actually studying this um, in connection with the litigation that I was involved with. I work as an expert witness in litigations involving these issues, and I was working on one of the Spotify litigations. And in Canada, the same kind of thing happened, but it was much more publicly documented. And so you could actually look at people saying certain things about how, met, how much um, unpaid mechanicals there were and how many albums were released before getting the rights cleared and all that sort of thing. And it was a really big amount of uh, unpaid mechanicals. And so for everything in Canada that was un uncleared, pretty much the same in the US and most likely elsewhere, although I didn't study the UK or Germany, France, whatever. But that was a, a big uh, sort of source of friction during the uh, CD transition as well. Hmm. Fascinating. I love the sort of behind the scenes, under the hood type aspect of this. So thank you for adding that in. Howie, is there anything you want to jump in and add further before we continue further? No, we can move on. Fair enough. Um, the thing I'd like to move on from, on to really, is uh, kind of something that, again, I hadn't really realized could have been an option earlier. But given these fault lines you've both just described, there does seem to be a lot of urgency and impetus behind kind of, okay, well, what's going to solve these problems? And so I was fascinated to read that the idea of music streaming actually came up inside the industry much earlier than I expected, but didn't take off until quite a long time after the idea had initially come up. What prevented music streaming from starting sooner rather than when it did? Um, well, there were... Uh as we've discussed before, some of it was technological and some of it was business-based. So before I joined Warner Music, I was at AT&T and Bell Labs, and we were, AT&T was a sponsor of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and we actually built a streaming jukebox um, at the Rock Hall that contained every song from every inductee at the time. By the way, that still exists in Cleveland. It's been updated and the technology has been changed. But the reason we were able to do it was that we had a high-speed network that ran from the server in the basement to the multimedia kiosk, which, by the way, had touch screens. So you requested the song you wanted to play or the artist you wanted to listen to by touching a screen. So there were a lot of elements in that uh, product um, uh, that uh, uh, resembles the streaming experience today. But there was no way to do that for the average fan. It took 12 minutes, even with a compressed MP3 file, to download it over, you know, dial-up connections that were there in the late 90s. Um, and there were services such as Rhapsody in the early 2000s, um, but they couldn't really compete with the Discman or the cassette because they weren't mobile. They were really tethered to the computer. And um, until we were able to, to provide 
the, the fact that we could download MP3s versus streaming and burn them to disk with your personal computer was what kept the data mobile. And until we had smartphones and app stores and you know higher speed networks that allowed the bits to make it from the server to the device in your hand, we really didn't have a good mobile solution for music. Yes, we could put MP3s on, on our iPod uh, in the 2000s, um, but we had to get that all those pieces ready in advance so that then you could go listen. Um, and of course, uh, even having secure storage on those devices so that you could place the songs on a app that would work while you were subscribing, but then the songs would be unplayable when the subscription ran out or you didn't pay was an important element too. So there were a whole bunch of technology pieces to make streaming, once again, a really convenient solution. Um, you know, it's remarkable today to think about that, you know, we carry around in our hands a device that can access literally, you know, tens of millions of tracks available in the Spotify or Apple Music or Amazon catalog. Yet when we started with the iPod in the early 2000s, the Apple ad was 10,000 songs in your pocket. Hmm. Hmm. All right. That, that, that makes sense. Um, I mean, I, I suppose it, in some ways it seems surprising that the idea came up, but it highlights, I think, the importance of the technological aspect to this. Bill, is there anything you'd like to add on this point? <clears throat> Yeah, the, the, the other factor, those are all very important factors, but the factor that I also like to point to is that this model of you pay $10 or 10 pounds a month and you get access to this enormous library but that you don't own in any sense was an unfamiliar model to consumers. <clears throat> there wasn't any real analog to that model um, in other forms of media, so consumers didn't really get it. And educating consumers to get used to or desire a new model is a very expensive uh, undertaking. And I remember someone from Apple I know made a comment that, that was something like, you know, we, we paid half a billion dollars to educate the public on buying individual tracks instead of albums on iTunes. And, you know, what, to, how much true that is or not is, is beside the point. The point is that it's a very expensive undertaking, takes a lot of effort and cleverness and, and time. And during the early days of interactive streaming, like Rhapsody and some of those other early services, none of those companies had those resources to do that education. And, and I actually worked for a, um, an interactive streaming startup in the late 2000s uh, one that didn't particularly succeed, certainly not in the U.S. Uh, and, um, it, you know, there were a lot of services like that at the time. None of them were all that successful, even though all of them did pretty much the same thing. They all offered this big catalog for a subscription price or what have you. But then when Spotify came, they did two things that sort of broke the impasse. One was they came up with this freemium model where you could get free access if you listen to ads and you accepted certain limitations on um, the service. And they, the record labels agreed to license into that. And then the other one was um, just all the hype that they got. Uh, there, there was a tsunami of hype that they got when they had launched in the Nordics and then prepared for their US launch. It, it, someone estimated that, that they got a billion dollars of free publicity by all the um, you know breathless coverage in the news, the mainstream news, as well as the industry trade rags. And so there's a billion, that's double the half a billion that the guy from Apple said that they needed to educate the market about individual tracks. So those were the two elements that broke the logjam. And around the same time, there was a third element, which was YouTube, which had become an increasingly popular place to go for music on demand had achieved its license agreements with the major labels. And so that was 2011. And after that, you see this just very rapid hockey stick growth in the interactive streaming market. And so it was all those factors together, once again, that uh, enabled the growth of that market. So 
now that we've in some ways come all the way up to the present, um, gone from the discs and the cylinders all the way up to Spotify and streaming, I have a few questions about kind of zooming out and looking at the whole thing overall, the whole period of history. And I wanted to start with um, asking about the creative side to this, because at various points in the book, you discuss ways in which the technological changes, the way the industry was structured, impacted how creative the people actually making the songs were making decisions about the songs. So I was wondering if we could talk a bit about song construction, titles, that kind of thing, and how they've been influenced by these technological changes we've been discussing. Um, perhaps, Bill, you want to start us off? Um, sure. Well, this this um, goes all the way back to the beginning. The length of early sound recordings was a, a function of the technology, but it was also a function of various musical traditions such as folk and, and whatnot, popular song, you know, a, a drawing room singing, a, a parlor singing, things like that. But then once recordings came out and people listened to them, the idea of what you could put on a sound recording given the t whatever the technology was of the day started to itself be an input. And so, for example, I actually, this isn't in our book, but I just read it in a, in a different book, a music critics uh, book, uh, Charles Shar Murray, who is a well-known English music critic writing about Jimi Hendrix and his roots in the blues, among other things, said that Robert Johnson, the legendary blues artist, was the first big blues artist to have listened to blues on record. And so he presumably, we don't know for sure, but presumably created his blues songs with the construction and length of a recording in mind. And so that you, you might think that that's an example of an early uh, way that a format of recording influenced the creative process. And <clears throat> then of course you get to jazz musicians who instead of getting to go 20 minutes in a club, they, could, they had to limit their solos to whatever would fit in a song on a 78 um, during the pre-vinyl era. <clears throat> and then, sort of conversely, you get to the 1960s when rock musicians had this whole album side available to them and they no longer had to focus on hit singles. And so you got concept albums, you got instances where the artists and the producers would treat the entire LP format as a canvas th for their creative output. You got Sgt. Pepper, you got Tommy from The Who, you got Days of Future Past by the Moody Blues. Freak Out by Frank Zappa uh, and all sorts of stuff like that. And, and of course, a lot of jazz took advantage of, of the extended um, capacity of the LP. And then when the CD came out, one of the origin stories of which there are several and how I could tell you more about this, of the length of, of the CD and its length was you could fit a symphony, not just a concerto, but a symphony, or you could fit an opera. And so there, there and then that engenders works of that length that didn't fit on, on vinyl or on two sides of vinyl. And, and then in the other direction, you've got the shortening of songs for the streaming area era, and then the even further shortening of songs for TikTok and getting to the chorus faster because you've got to, uh, it has to be listened to for 30 seconds to count as a play on streaming services and things like that. There are all kinds of instances of this. Wow, there's a whole bunch there. And I, I was so <clears throat> intrigued to see the change over time with the same sort of idea. Howie, is there anything you'd like to add on this point? Yeah, let's let's go all the way to today and talk about a couple of current artists and see how things are being influenced, amplifying on what Bill said, uh, uh, you know, about streaming and TikTok. We have um, Pink Pantheris is a current uh, pop artist, although calling her pop is a little bit misleading because she records in many genres, which is another creative choice that's happening because genre is becoming less important as, as we have access to everything on streaming. And, you know, we ask for similar songs or songs I might like. We're getting a broader set of tastes and we're seeing, you know, global artists like BTS emerge where, artists are popular. Same thing is happening in Latin music, where that's becoming a much more important genre in countries where um, 
Spanish is not necessarily the, the native language of its citizens. But Pink Pantheris has an album where she has a whole bunch of songs that are a minute 30 in length. Very, very short. They're short um, in part because they want to engage people and playing to the end is a good thing because the services observe when people click away quickly, they don't get paid. But if they click away before the end of the song, they're more, less likely to recommend that song in the future. But the collection of songs, the album is made up of many, many short songs, lots and lots of tracks, because if you listen to the whole album as a playlist, you get paid on every one of the tracks separately. It's not based on the amount of time. It's based on uh, the play of a track for at least 30 seconds. And so that's, you know, one example. Another artist, uh, Steve Lacey, became very, very popular on TikTok. And there's a... um, an example of how that's changing his interaction with fans and the length of the music. So as we know, TikTok videos are very, very short. He became very popular. He was selling out larger and larger venues. And as is common for artists who like to engage with their live audience, he asked the audience to sing along with him. And at 30, and they did. Um, And at 30 seconds, the audience in his biggest hits stopped singing. They didn't know the rest of the song. They knew the 30 seconds from the TikTok video. So, you know, there are lots of examples like that. And if we want to rewind the clock all the way to beginning, I'm big on words and terminology. In fact, the reason we have a record album as a term is because of the restrictions on what could be recorded in terms of the amount of music on a disc. If you wanted to record a Broadway album uh, on the 78 uh, records that were, you know, made of shellac in the early days, you could only put one song on the side of one disc. And so if you wanted a collection of eight or 10 songs, you had to have a collection of discs and to give those, to distribute them to fans, the record industry took the idea of the photo album, a binder with sleeves that could hold all those discs And that was why we call it a record album, because it was a collection of discs. When we finally made a disc that was good enough, uh, as Bill described earlier, to hold a concerto, um, we still called it a record album, even though there was only one disc. Hmm. Interesting to see these things come together. And I'm just the mental image of singing along until it hits the 30 second mark and suddenly the arena silent is just... I mean, really iconic, but probably deeply embarrassing for whomever is on stage at that point. Uh, So moving away then from that moment of embarrassment, uh, a similar, or I guess not a similar question, but in the same vein of kind of looking at this as a big picture, I admit this is not just something uh, that I think is worth discussing based on what you put in the book, but also something I've personally been curious about for a while. So I was intrigued that you answer it in the book. Why do people still listen to radio? And what does this tell us about the role of technology in the music business? <laughs> well, it's, it's funny. There is a consulting firm called Jacobs Media that does these annual surveys. They're called the Jacobs Media Tech Surveys. And <clears throat> they're designed to provide data for radio station owners that will help them tighten up their air sound for the you know most listeners and the best advertisers and whatnot. And one of the things that they do in this survey is they ask people, and the people who they give the survey to are all radio station listeners. They're radio listeners. They're not non-radio listeners. They're just radio listeners. But they ask these people, here's a list of possible reasons why you listen to the radio, which are your most um, Im- important reasons. <clears throat> and there is a distinct trend over the past 10, 15 years, whatever it's been, I think actually more like 20 years, where the reasons related to music have become lower and lower on the priority list or the favorites list, whereas the reasons that relate to the DJs who are on or the non-musical information, traffic, weather, news, things like that, are becoming higher on the list. And there are a lot of obvious reasons for that, obvious to people in the music industry. One is, you know, radio stations, at least I'm talking the US here, 
commercial radio stations are very tightly formatted uh, because they're, a lot of them are run by big profit-making corporations and they're, they tend to be conservative and whatnot. And so the, there's very little variety in the music that they play, despite the fact that everybody wants more variety. The radio stations uh, have to appeal to sort of the common denominator audience. They're most popular listen to in automobiles where there might be more than one person. And so you have to satisfy everyone who's in the car uh, or a public place, th things like that. There's a lot of commercials which are annoying. You know, they're interrupting. And there's also a genuine value for these non-musical aspects of, um, of radio programming, such as news and weather. And then there's also uh, the variety that you get with talk that you don't get with the music that's being played. So all of this is adding up to radio having a more and more diminished <clears throat> place in the in the music industry, even though a growing percentage of radio listening is done digitally now. In other words, it's not done over the actual AM or FM frequencies. It's being done um, through streams of radio stations, simulcast uh, streams of radio stations. And so um, now you have a situation where people who are, you know, ARs or marketing people at labels who are looking to promote music. Radio is not sort of the be all end all, certainly, that it was a generation ago. Now it's sort of a later stage activity in the promotional life cycle where you, if you're, let's say, an AR or, or a promotional rep, you decide what songs to push to radio based on the demographic data that you get from for their streaming performance and their performance on TikTok and Spotify and so on. You, and only then do you decide, okay, we're going to try and get radio to play XYZ track and not the other way around. And so all of this is really leading radio to be a less and less important part of the promotional mix for a label or an artist. Uh, and in, in my opinion, the only thing that's really keeping radio relevant at all is the fact that it's so popular in cars, where uh, a lot of the reason why people listen to radio in cars is because of the non-musical information and because it's just so easy to use compared to fiddling around even with your phone or with an MP3 player or whatever it is while you're trying to drive. Hmm. All right. There are some clear reasons there. So thank you for illuminating them. Um in a similar vein, I'd like to ask perhaps another obvious question. Unless, Howie, is there anything you'd like to add first? No, I'm good. Okay, great. So then my next question is, in some ways in the same vein, um, radio has very much continued, but we've seen very much a resurgence of vinyl. Um, it wasn't kind of continually a big thing, but it definitely has come back. You discuss in the book that there are kind of reasons that vinyl has come back, but other physical formats are unlikely to. Why might that be? Well, that's a great question. And there have been, a, frankly, I don't think any of us really know the answer to this. Um, the vinyl revival, so vinyl was at a near death in the mid 2000s, and it's come back steadily ever since to the point where, depending on how you measure it and whom you talk to, it accounts for somewhere in the low double figures percentage of the market. So maybe 10, 15% of the market, depending again on, on various factors. So it's a significant piece of the market. And there are certain aesthetic considerations that you can point to, such as you have this nice 12 inch canvas for cover art, liner notes, things like that, that you don't get with cassettes and don't get with CDs. So that's one thing. Then you have um, this idea that there's this almost ritualistic aspect to playing vinyl where you lay the, plat the, the disc on the turntable and you put the tone arm and it's almost like a ritualistic thing. Um, whereas with a CD, you could argue that you're just throwing it into a slot and there's nothing very ritualistic about that. There, there are a number of different reasons. I think another reason that perhaps is not talked about as much is that a lot of music nowadays that we consider to be, and maybe I'm betraying my age and my generation, a lot of music that we consider to be iconic now was first released on vinyl as the lead off format. And so that's a lot of classic rock, soul, uh, even early hip hop, 
and certainly jazz and classical, when you think of those records, when you think of Abbey Road, when you think of Kind of Blue, when you think of fulfilling this first finale, um, you know, anything like that, or even it takes a nation of millions to hold us back, you think about an LP. Maybe in the case of hip hop, you think of a cassette or a CD, but people think of albums, they think of LPs. It's sort of a, an ingrained notion in people's minds. But honestly, these are all kind of educated guesses and no one really knows what the magic formula has been. Um, an, another factor that I'll also mention, which is in the book, is this idea that you own something. And yes, you own CDs, you own cassettes, but you don't, so when downloads happened, you don't really own anything when you've purchased an MP3 or whether you've gotten an MP3 without purchasing it. It's just some bits that are set a certain way on your hard drive. And despite various companies' attempts to convince you otherwise, and certainly from a legal standpoint, you don't actually own anything. And with streaming, you definitely don't own anything when you're using Spotify or Apple Music or YouTube. But with a piece of vinyl, you definitely own something. There's something that you can point to on your shelf that you can organize by alphabet or by genre or what have you, and you can sort of treat it like a, a treasured object that you own. So there are a number of factors and no one really knows what the magic formula is, at least I don't uh, purport to know. Yeah, there's one more key point that Bill didn't mention, which is that these vinyl records are often for the fans a piece of merchandise, a way of showing their fandom, their love of a particular artist. There's a large percentage of people who buy vinyl who don't own a record player. So they're not buying it to listen to the music on the vinyl. They're buying it. Uh, Bill often tells the story of his daughter's college roommate using the album covers as decoration on the wall. They're a visible symbol of fandom that people can use. And artists are playing into that. Uh, Lana Del Rey, who's nominated for a whole bunch of Grammys this year, um, issued six different vinyls for the record, collectible items, fans of K-pop buy many versions of the same record. So the fact that this is merchandise, like a, a, you know, a, a T-shirt or a keychain or something else that people would buy to identify the fandom is a big part of this vinyl revival. And I, personally, I don't think that cassettes are going to be that same sort of collectible item. Um, perhaps it will be for some hip hop, as Bill suggests, but um, it doesn't have quite the same resonance with fans that vinyl seems to. Well, and they don't look as good on the wall. They're much smaller, there right? You they, go. Don't, <laughs> they don't fulfill that same form factor. So those are all very good reasons, even if we don't know exactly what the formula is. Howie, turning to an area I know that you focused on a bit in the book, can you take us through the similarities that we might see between the very new shiny thing right now of TikTok and the perhaps much less new and shiny, but perhaps quite similar uh, form of MTV? Right. Well, again, and this is part of an, yet another thread that goes throughout the history of the interest in combining video imagery with music. Um, interestingly enough, if, again, if we rewind the clock all the beginning, they made a movie with Enrico Caruso. It wasn't a hit. It was a silent movie. So showing Caruso singing and trying to separately play the record to sync up with the silent movie before sound films were available was not a great solution. And today we see one of the biggest movies of the year being Taylor Swift's Eras Tour. So there's always been an interest in seeing as well as listening to the artist. And obviously, MTV fundamentally changed the industry. We got artists who were MTV stars as much as they were recording stars. We think of, you know, Michael Jackson, certainly, although Michael Jackson was the biggest recording artist in the industry, there's no question that his videos, which um, at first were not played on MTV. There was actually resistance to playing anything other than rock with white musicians at first for a variety of reasons we go into in the book. Um, but, you know, he got even bigger and became the king of pop with Thriller and other seminal music videos. Madonna as yet another example where, you know, her 
dancing, her visual imagery. You know, if I mention a Madonna song to you, you may think of the video as much as you think of the recording. And TikTok, yet again, tells this same kind of message where we had uh, um, influencers who were dancers. They weren't even necessarily doing their own music, but they were creatively um, uh, expanding the audience for this music and, and old stuff became popular again. So we have examples where, you know, Nathan Apodaca, somebody nobody had ever heard of on a skateboard while Fleetwood Mac's dreams played in the background and dreams entered the top 10 on the billboard charts again. So TikTok was more than a novelty. It was a promotional vehicle for music that perhaps the TikTok generation wasn't familiar with. And when MTV started, many of the labels did not want to give their videos for free uh, because MTV wasn't paying to play them uh, until there was demonstrated proof that um, showing these videos, much like dreams on this TikTok video, could increase the engagement with fans. Um, In some ways, you know, uh, We teach data analytics, and this was a natural experiment. MTV started not on the coasts, but in places where cables were laid in the street to get TV signals to places where over the air couldn't work. So you had many smaller markets, uh, smaller cities, smaller towns that had cable. It was not in New York. It was not in Los Angeles. And lo and behold, bands that had music videos, often they were new wave bands from England because there were promotional videos made in England when they weren't a popular item for labels to make for U.S. artists. New wave bands would show up in Iowa or Ohio and play a concert and it would sell out and their records would sell out. So we had a natural experiment where they weren't as popular in terms of sales and ticket sales sales of records and ticket sales in New York or LA, but they were selling in markets where MTV had their videos on heavy rotation. And they were in heavy rotation because there weren't enough videos from the biggest artists because the labels weren't making them available. So the promotional value of these platforms, once proved in, got the labels to say, oh, We better go work with MTV, even if they're not paying at first. Ultimately, they did. And, oh, we better go work with TikTok because it is proving to be engaging with fans. So who knows what will happen then with TikTok as that engagement increases, as it does really sound like it's like to, um, given what happened with MTV. Well, if I can add, I think we kind of know one direction it's going to go, which is if you're on TikTok and you discover a song you want to listen to, you can go click over to Apple Music or to Amazon or to Spotify to listen to the full track. But, you know, if you're TikTok, you look at that and say, well, why should we give our customer that we've educated about this music over to somebody else? And so there are lots of discussions underway what kind of uh, more comprehensive music service should TikTok offer to its fans rather than turning its customers over to Spotify or Apple Music? So we may see TikTok become a competitor to some degree to the full length, full catalog streaming services that are already out there. Well, and so, and actually this is already happening in a couple of countries. I think Indonesia, Brazil, and maybe one or two other India, I think maybe, but their TikTok clearly wants to do this. The labels are pushing back because of uh, the, in the issues of royalty terms and control and whatnot. And, and I'd also like to, to say, to add something to what Howie said, which is one big difference between fundamental difference between TikTok and MTV is MTV depended on record labels submitting videos to them to have anything to play on their channel. <clears throat> Whereas with TikTok, <clears throat> it's all user contributed. And much of the emphasis on TikTok is on the just the people who upload stuff and use existing music versus the artists behind that music. And in fact, I found when I, when I was looking around at this, there are a lot of TikTok users with names like and I'm, I'm not going to remember this exactly, but just to give you an idea of the flavor of it, 
people have user account names like you know the real Lady Gaga or the Taylor Swift channel. Um, and TikTok doesn't really police this in any way, so people can do that. And then how he described uh, Nathan Apodaca's Fleetwood Mac uh, video, well, he was able to choose that music, and he is the one who became a huge TikTok star, in addition to Fleetwood Mac's song being re-entered into the Billboard charts and you know, a whole lot of interest around that album and the, the album Rumors becoming one of the top 10 vinyl sellers of the year but there's sort of more control and more focus on just the everyday users who are posting their videos with music. And so this is a, a challenge for the labels and the artists. How do we become part of this again? How do we compete for lack of a better term with the everyday users who are becoming big TikTok stars using existing uh, copyrighted music? Hmm. That's a very good point. And I think is, a very open question. I'm, I'm quite intrigued to see what happens with it. But um, I do have one further question to throw in. If I've not complicated things too much already, uh, I do have a final question to ask the both of you in this vein of what will happen next. And of course, I do have to make it about artificial intelligence. So to end the interview, where do you both think artificial intelligence might engender transformative change in the music industry? Well, I think first it's worth pointing out how much it's already part of the fabric of the music industry. Um, we may not think of it that way, but whether it's, you know, uh, how playlists are generated on the streaming services, the data analytics that go into looking at the TikTok data and the streaming data and engagement on Instagram to predict which artists are likely to grow in popularity. Those predictive models use artificial intelligence. Um, artists are releasing new records in multiple languages where their translation of their, vo of their voice into another language is built on a voice model. Um, so there are a whole bunch of places already. Mastering of records, you can, hi you can hire an AI mastering engineer uh, through startups um, that are much cheaper than hiring some of the great uh, um, mastering engineers who cost a lot of money. So it, we're already seeing lots of places. The area, though, where it's likely to be the most disruptive is in generative AI, where we're creating voices, we're creating instrumentation, we're creating new music, and it is hard to keep up with what is happening in that space every day. And I'll let Bill expand on that. Sure. So um, we are at an inflection point in the ability of people to use tools to generate just more music, but just sheer volume. And um, I actually made a graph of this for something else that I was doing. The volume of record releases per year since I forget when, but the 1970s, let's say. And it's really clear from looking at that data which by the way, is not perfect data. It's, it's what exists on Discogs, which is you know, a reason or, or music brains. It's, it's a reasonable amount of data, but it's not exactly perfect data. But you see certain inflection points that followed immediately on the heels of the introduction of certain technologies that made records a lot easier to, to produce and release. Going all the way back to the 1950s with reel-to-reel -reel tape recording replacing disc cutters. And so one of the people we interviewed for our book, Jack Holtzman, the founder of Elektra Records, legendary figure in the, in the music business, he was able to start his label as a folk, an indie folk label in the early 50s, I think, by simply buying a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and microphone and maybe a couple other pieces of equipment and taking advantage of excess pressing capacity at the major labels, um, manufacturing plants and he was able to make a label that way to start up a label much easier and cheaper than let's say columbia or rca or deca had to do a, a generation previous and so if you fast forward a little bit you get to more recent enabling technologies such as the four track cassette porta studio that artists started to use in the 1980s and the most notable output of which was probably Bruce Springsteen's album, Nebraska, was recorded that way. 
Then you go to the digital audio workstation, um, the, you know, such as um, Pro Tools. And then you go to independent digital distributors like CD Baby and TuneCore that enabled anyone to get their music onto all of the digital services, iTunes, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. A generative AI is another in this series of inflection points that's going to result in a dramatic increase in just the volume of music that's produced. And just to give you an idea that this is already happening, there are a couple of AI, generative AI music startups. One is called Mubert, another is called Boomi. And they will tell you that their technology has been used to generate tens of millions of tracks of music, distinct, different tracks of music. That doesn't mean that they're all up on Spotify necessarily, maybe a few of them are, but just the technology has been used to generate that, mil that many million tracks. And then if you look at somebody like Spotify, their catalog is maybe a hundred million or a little bit more than that. And so we're talking the same orders of magnitude. And we, we've also been seeing in recent years that the pace of release of, of music has accelerated in recent years. And I think it's gonna accelerate even further. Right now we're at the insane, in my opinion, point where every day, every day, something like 140, 150,000 tracks are released to, to digital music services worldwide. That's every day, which is three orders of magnitude more than what was released in the CD era of the 80s and 90s. And that number is only gonna accelerate itself. And so I don't know where this ends up. Um, maybe we're headed toward a post-content world where you know, there, there isn't any necessarily particular interest in a specific piece of content, but just the ability to generate whatever content you want on demand in real time becomes more um, important. I don't know, but um, that's certainly a factor in, in where this is all going. Yeah, it is, it, you know, I, I've said um, in an, I participated in the Copyright Office listening session on AI, and I said, this is all likely to play out in two places. And again, this is a lesson from history. It's going to play out in courtrooms and in conference rooms. Courtrooms because the artists, and this is not just musical artists, but authors and graphic artists are uh, filing complaints in court saying that their copyrighted works have been used to train these large language models or audio models without permission and without compensation. And um, if you read the filings in court and the documents that have been submitted to the U.S. Copyright Office, you can see the battle brewing over whether this is permissible under theories such as fair use, which have allowed other um, uses of copyrighted works without permission, or whether there will have to be payments. At the same time that's happening, you have negotiations underway between the major labels and startups and the largest companies. Um, Universal is working with uh, Google and particular artists to create voice models and music based on the recordings of those artists. So there are going to be conference room discussions um, to come up with new business models, and there are going to be courtroom fights over these rights. And again, history shows us this takes time. An individual case may be resolved quickly. It took less than two years for Napster to get shut down, but it took 10 years until the last of the file sharing networks closed its doors um, because of lots of machinations that we describe in the book. And so you know, when people have been asking us, what's the next thing after AI, Bill and I say, we're just at the beginning of AI, and this is likely to be a lengthy fight. And just as we said earlier, as the industry sees the growth in streaming slowing in developed markets, streaming is growing in terms of revenues around the world, but in the established markets, growth is slowing. And I think that's part of why we're seeing more activity on the licensing front to figure out the next major disruption, to get a business model in place, to take care of some of those other C's that we've described in our framework early rather than waiting till later. But the pressure of the court rulings will influence, you know, how the money gets, how the money flows. 
Yeah, I would add to that. I'm actually, one of the things I'm doing now is I'm working on one of these discussions as, as Howie puts it. And, and I would say that, uh, be, you know, between copyright holding representatives and the tech side. And one thing that I will say is that in general, there's sort of more of an attitude of lessons learned after the Napster era, where there's more sentiment on the copyright holding side, you know, let, let's try and sit down with our brethren on the tech side to try and work this out. And conversely, there's also, I think, more of, of an understanding on the tech side that, hey, you know, you do need a healthy creator ecosystem to enable uh, technologies to, to work with. And it's not just, you know, oh, this content stuff, it's all a pile of bits, who cares, which was a lot of the prevailing attitude of the tech industry during the Napster era. I think there's been lessons learned on both sides. Now having, and so I'm more optimistic that yes, there will be lawsuits. There, there are lawsuits as Howie said, there will be more lawsuits. There will certainly be a lot of rhetoric and, and whatnot, but um, there's more of an attitude of let's see how we can sit down and work this out. Um, I do agree with Howie that part of the, another part of the, let's call it softening of attitudes has to do with the fact that the industry is currently not in a peak as high as it was with the CD back in the early 90s. Uh, we're at a, you know, sort of a mini peak with streaming. But if you look at our revenue chart, for example, in the book, you'll see that um, the, the peak in revenues, even adjusted for inflation, is only maybe two thirds what it was, if that, uh, of the CD era. And so there is a sense that you know, more growth is possible uh, and the growth is gonna have to come from other means besides finding new new geographic markets uh, to increase uh, streaming revenue in such as Africa and, and um, South Asia and whatnot. Mm. Thank you both for pointing out so many of the different areas that we can all keep an eye on to see what happens next. Um, it's very appreciated to both from this book understand the history and have a framework for looking forward. So thank you very much uh, both for taking us through that. And of course, for listeners who now want to dig into all the details of the book, the title as a reminder is Key Changes, The 10 Times Technology Transformed the Music Industry, published by Oxford University Press. Howie, Bill, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you so thank much. This has been a great conversation. Thanks, Miranda. Thanks, Miranda.